back to another episode of COVID-19 from crisis to creation here on Mentory TV. I'm your host, Patricia falco Beckali. Well, for today I thought, what can we learn from nature, from evolution, in terms of how to survive a crisis? But not only as you and I, as people or as communities, but also as businesses. And in order to discuss the subject, I have a very special invitation today. Another woman joining the show. I'm so happy, Evelyn Flugi, that you could make it to Mentory TV to, to dig a little bit deeper and answer perhaps some of the questions that come up in our conversation. Thank you, Patricia. Thanks for having me. Glad to be part of it. Well, I'm just thinking uh, one thing, Evelyn. I mean, you've always been uh, a very studious person. Uh, you have a summa cum laude degree from ETH. You have worked as a portfolio manager, as an analyst. So you, just like me, you like drilling down into issues and kind of plug from different areas of whatever is surrounding us in order to look at a certain uh, situation, a problem, even a crisis, and see how, how you can put it together. Tell mm -hmm. me, what did you actually what did you actually experience also as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, as a fund manager owning your own fund, the Singularity Group, uh, during this crisis? And what could you really apply from what maybe nature has to give us? Yeah, good question. Uh, because we basically our whole philosophy and methodology is a less based on financial research and more on what nature has been teaching us over and over again. And with nature, I also mean technology. Um, so we see uh, that most of the technologies that you can experience now already, and I think the ones to come, are often based on something that nature can already do. If you think about AI, artificial intelligence is trying to recreate our neural network and, and do things that humans do pretty quickly uh, with the machine yeah? and, and go beyond that, of course. And so I guess in this crisis, I mean, <laughs> learned a few things. Uh, more obviously, we saw how humans react in a crisis uh, once again, and I'm not excluded from it. So I'm not trying to say that I did anything superhuman uh, out of this, but it was great to see how, you know, very obvious crowded trades can, can emerge uh, on the downside and on the upside again. And uh, I guess what uh, something I learned late because I, I never applied it as an analyst before or, or I wasn't aware of it uh, for a long time is that actually nature and technology succeeds with trial and error. Uh, and less so, we try to tell ourselves that uh, we have an explanation for what happened and by, by doing enough research and being prepared, we can mitigate the next crisis or do better with uh, uh, the, the next one or, or create something. Um, but it's actually usually some sort of trial and error that has to happen before a real, this, this exponential growth and, and success really happens. So and, that's interesting yeah. because, you know, it's like learning by doing and yes. all I've been you know, discussing with other guests also on the show was, oh, you know, you have to get prepared. We've got our learnings now, and now we're going to do our homework to be prepared for the next crisis. But you mm -hmm. actually think that that is a natural, that is not really the key to success? Yeah, well, yeah, I'll boldly probably say that I don't think that's the key to success. No, I think it's good to do some research and have a plan, so, but more to feel good about yourself and feel confident. But I don't think the success comes from having had the plan. It comes from confidently uh, trying something. And then usually, I mean, I can say for the business that uh, we've built up so far, uh, we did a lot of things not the best way, the wrong way a few times, and still ended up building up something. And if we never started doing anything, we'd still be planning. Um, and, and I think uh, that's true for a lot of technologies these days that are uh, happening or not happening. I think the ones that are not happening is the ones that don't have a platform to try. And the ones that, that came about were sometimes also by error or by, by trial or yeah, not even uh, on purpose tried yeah. out. Yeah. yeah, and I, I think it's, it's uh, interesting to make it really specific, Evelyn, because mm -hmm. you funded in 2017 the Singularity Group, which is a very unique kind of investment fund. Mm -hmm. And I wonder you as a business owner, co-founder and CEO of this business, also looking to satisfy shareholders in this fund, mm -hmm. uh, what, 
what were you trying? What was the error? And what are you adjusting? Or what, you're, what are you actually even forking out and saying, no, this is definitely a no-go for the foreseeable future? <laughs> trying, I mean, <laughs> we tried a lot of things and we did a lot of errors. So I, I, I guess I'll try to pick uh, the few, and I mean, some of the errors we're still just living with, not that it was an error, you know, I mean, one of the things that I probably would now at this current state say I wouldn't do again is just launch a fund and wait for people to invest in it, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, because we thought, uh, also we thought about in terms of investment strategy, we had a cool idea, I think, to, to filter for technology that is already happening, that is in application. And it was 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 easy to kind of show that to clients that this can create uh, some sort of value and then we thought oh this is the perfect way to invest and so we created a global all sector all market cap portfolio that kind of covers basically whatever you want to do in equities and what we didn't realize is that most clients already have parts of that covered and they're only looking for a little solution to what's missing in their portfolio so us creating this all-encompassing diversified portfolio with, by the way, also, you know, a large number of positions that fits into a global equity strategy if you need that, um, or that can add value to an existing portfolio as a supplement. It often wasn't the exact solution that clients were, were looking for. And so I guess maybe what we didn't do we just dug our, our heads down built up something and thought this is going to be it and we're going to try sell it but i guess having more conversations with actual potential clients and finding out what they really need um uh, so that is kind of a prep that we, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we could yeah. have done. but it, finally we only learned this by putting something out there and, and finding out that it, it couldn't be done because i think personally i wouldn't have approached anyone with just an idea I felt like I needed to have something before I, I went out to people. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting one. It's always this kind of search book for perfection rather than the progress. And you're referring yeah. to we had to progress. We had to kind mm -hmm. of find out what do people really need and what can we really cater for. And I think this, mm -hmm. is, this is so interesting as a business model in itself. Mm -hmm. Never bring out the perfect answer simply because if you do, guess what? You're not selling the next model, the next model, the next model. I mean, look at, you know, what Microsoft has been creating with all these updates or Apple phones. So if they would have brought the ultimate Apple phone, which I don't know it's going to be like, and nobody <laughs> exactly. does. We probably couldn't have handled it at the time. We weren't ready for it. Yeah, right? it, yeah that, that, that's a, another good point. But yeah. let's talk a little bit more about this technology and why I tried to communicate right at the intro, why your fund may be a little bit more special when mm -hmm. you look at technology as such. Because... I think you're looking at uh, very innovative, disruptive technologies, but it's very difficult to get into the right stocks there. However, mm -hmm. you found a way which is mitigating risk at the same time as having exposure to very breakthrough technologies, right? Yeah, we, we, we think we've identified a way to go about it, definitely. Um, so different uh, for sure, I think it's special. The difference is that we... We, I wouldn't say we don't invest in companies that are in the CapEx phase because many of the companies we have in the portfolio also spend a lot of money on tech, obviously. Um, but I think the unusual thing is if you think about new technologies, particularly many of them in, are in an early stage where they are promising, but much of them is not yet applied. And the way to go about this is to identify a technology that is uh, promising that you want to apply and then you invest into these technologies with a lot of CapEx and R&D. A lot of companies are doing this, but also investors. You buy startups, smaller companies that are providing this technology and hope to one day be this uh, 10x company, of course. And that is, uh, I think it's a great way to think about investing. It's just not the way we go about tech investing. So we are basically an addition to that. Um, what we try to do is most of these technologies, even in the earliest stage when nothing is happening, they're spending money somewhere. And so it's basically, it's a value chain approach, if you will, yeah. But even existing technologies that have made it to the commercial world, et cetera, there's always some money being spent. So we look at the cash outflow, uh, try to follow it uh, via companies that are spending the money via their invoices, basically. Who are they spending their money on? Because that means a revenue and a, and a money inflow somewhere else. And so this is our method of identifying. It sounds very easy and pragmatic. It's not that simple in application. 
Um, but as such, uh, I guess, you know, the risk mitigation you do is you're, you're less invested in kind of high risky companies that are not making any revenue and uh, that are only spending money. But it also allows you, uh, especially as these technologies evolve and progress and actually really make money, it allows you to filter for only technologies that do have this cash flow generation. Because there are R&D, for example, is something that rarely results in revenue anywhere else. It, re it goes to, to employees um, and, and gets kind of not lost, but it gets spent somewhere where it doesn't show up anywhere else as a cash flow. But CapEx does and OPEX does as well. So we have quite a few technologies that are an OPEX spent at one company and end up being a cash flow at another one. And in this stage, basically the tech has proven to be applicable in the existing world. And that is a risk mitigation because this is how you filter for technologies that have already survived. They've, they've reached the, past the first hurdle that you need for survival and they're ready they're basically at this point where they're ready to take off. Yeah, and I think this is a really interesting approach because you're kind of almost like test trying uh, within a cushy environment, i.e. a big blue chip company, or already applying some other supplies, value chain, let's just translate it also uh, for, for some of our community that does not necessarily know what value chain is. It's basically yeah. the suppliers. So if you have Zoom and you look at Zoom and you want to buy into Zoom, you know, mm -hmm. trade it on the stock exchange, maybe the stock have already gone I don't know where however the value chain i.e. the suppliers or the software the infrastructure whatever mm -hmm. that Zoom needs and buys in a value propositions in itself so by buying Zoom for example you as a fund you'd be buying into fantastic technologies as well which whilst they are performing not mm -hmm. necessarily outside of Zoom yet by themselves they're definitely performing within that client i.e. Zoom mm -hmm. and then once you can see that they're actually really now becoming a value proposition, one can even go and say, okay, I directly invest into that company. Should they float on the stock exchange or should there be a private equity opportunity to, to get into that? Is that right? Exactly. Yes. 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 And there, I mean, there are a number of publicly listed companies already uh, that are part of supply chains. And the good thing for us or for investors is good and bad. They're less sexy. So very often these companies aren't the Netflix, aren't the Zoom. They're not the, the bigger companies. But they're companies Adidas. Are. I was so surprised that you got, I mean, Adidas, we grew up with Adidas, you know. Nah. <laughs> that was always, a, you know, the, the poor. Were you one of those? I was a Nike girl. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, true, you're so much younger than me. Oh, my God. Yeah, okay. When I was little, there was still this tag between I'm wearing Adidas, I'm wearing Puma, and that was really all we had. Maybe a little bit of Old Star, but or, or, yeah. or, I don't know what they are called. Maybe Supergas. Anyway, but um, one of the companies you're holding is Adidas, which you actually see as an innovation, innovative technology admitted stock. That, that the Singularity Group would hold. Why is that? Yeah, well, it's, it's definitely part of our, our index, that, uh, the Singularity Index that we created with NASDAQ. Um, Adidas shows up actually as a materials uh, um, developer or as advanced materials, as we would call it, because it, that's the tech, yeah? It's an innovative new way of handling materials and building them, moving them into uh, products. And actually... We discovered this also, interestingly, a little bit by mistake because we were, were definitely looking for a way, uh, we were looking at companies that were spending money on new material design and we thought that it was a topic related to 3D printing and some of the other technologies that we look into. And so we created a filter that was going to identify any sort of new material creation that could be used in 3D printing or other new technology applications. And Adidas lit up and uh, we thought it was their 3D printed shoes. That, that everybody was talking <laughs> yeah. about. Yeah, yeah. And uh, interestingly, though, we, we had a call with management and then they confirmed that uh, actually the, what we identified was the recycled material that they were moving into, uh, into their, their clothes and shoes. And it started, uh, what they also fulfilled is what, something we also look for is a, a certain growth rate in, in the growth of, of those revenues because to, to come to nature again, um, most of the time when something starts being applicable in nature or in tech, it tends to have uh, an exponential growth rate uh, 
shortly after that, if it really is an exponential technology, if it really is something that's here to stay and to disrupt and take over the world. Yeah, no, it is it's super interesting. And before coming back to singularity itself and AI and then circling back into nature, which I think is something really interesting to talk about, let's drill a little bit deeper uh, into what the disruptive technologies are going to be. And I wonder to what extent you would also see, uh, Evelyn, that this uh, COVID-19 crisis and the dynamics of what was kind of switched off in our uh, society, economy, modus operandi, and what was kind of lighting up because of it. And um, I prepared another screen share. My, my viewers know already that I'm a bit rookie with my screen shares, but I always try to put one in simply because I, uh, I really, really like screen sharing. And let's see whether that, yeah. So these are the McKinsey and Company Disruptive Technologies. Mm -hmm. And I liked it because of the colors. <laughs> I don't know if any of our viewers or yeah. you can actually see something. Mm -hmm. But why don't you pick a couple of them out um, where you actually have seen in your fund, especially also now in the last few months, the, the ones that have been performing and really proving resilience in mm -hmm. this type of crisis. And some of them which might have been disruptive or seen as good opportunities before COVID-19, but in the post era might lose dynamics. Yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned, you know, the one of the ones have that have proven and have performed. And I actually think that that's not maybe might not be the same because interestingly, yeah, the renewable energy and the kind of sustainability topic around that did get a lot of attention through COVID. Um, but I don't think it is in any way uh, an immediate effect of, uh, of this crisis. Yeah, it's a side effect um, that, that makes people more aware of our, our lifestyle uh, and what we need to change about it and how it has really had an effect on nature. And I think what's driven any kind of renewable energy um, you know, rebound or, or stock performance is more sentiment driven than really... I don't see, you know, from this shock, uh, it's a really uh, renewed investment. Uh, we already had this before, yeah? Sustainability was the star of buzzwords before mm -hmm. COVID came. So I actually think it's actually taken a little bit of a step back in terms of where investments are really going to go in terms of companies that are making the... Uh, the transition happening, but investors kind of interpret uh, it as a as an opportunity now. So I think there's actually a discrepancy there. Um, I definitely feel like the anything that has to do with things communicating with each other and being yeah. more autonomous. Um, so anything here on the the right side of the slide. Um, that has to do with automation, doing things autonomously. That means without humans involved. So because you don't want to touch anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. And actually, they all play together. So it's funny that they're, they're kind of all leading away from this. But I mean, in our base philosophy, it's we, we basically foresee a convergence of many of these technologies. And here, cloud um, automation, not necessarily of work, but of everything, and more advanced robotics. Robotics was yeah. already a super you know, exponential technology that created massive investor returns already. I think that's going even a step further. And the Internet of Things topic that got kind of thrown in with the 5G evolution, uh, I think is more prominent now than ever because you cannot do anything. Uh, when, whenever you want to do things autonomously, you need communication between objects as well, not just humans and objects. And here the Internet of Things uh, will play a, a substantial role. So I would, I would actually, it's funny that the, at the right side, uh, strikes me more of yeah. uh, something. Although advanced materials is here on the left side. Um, Midi printing, yeah. Yeah, definitely there. Although, I mean, I have my personal struggles with 3D printing because I, I read and saw a lot of reports about how, you know, wanting to, I do believe that the supply chains are going to be more local. Um, mm -hmm. or that, and that's a long-term trend. I think mid to long-term companies will and countries will try to make sure they're not uh, as dependent on just one location providing something. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, but uh, that doesn't mean that you can just all of a sudden three D print something somewhere because the reason 
even now you can't just 3D print everything is you don't have multiple material print. You cannot print something that's more than a few, maybe three materials. Second thing is you still need resources. Yeah. And then, I mean, you still have resource dependency on some countries and regions that won't go away. So it's not, and it's not very uh, economic to, to 3D print and um, everything, mo most things, especially lots of through, you know, things that are, you do often actually it's special items that you need a lot of that you 3d print but people won't just start 3d printing everything yeah, so. yeah yeah but interesting that you mentioned that basically that if nothing else if it becomes industrial um production and you need to do it locally that perhaps 3d printing in the medium term or even in the long term might be part of the solution yeah but uh, i mean to your comment or to the, the the topic we had before about advanced materials yeah before you can do that you need better materials and ma materials that can be 3d printed so i think the the technology or the theme that will really grow quickly first before anything in 3d printing happens will be the advanced materials topic no, that's uh, super, super interesting. And then I wonder about what you were just saying, robotics. And robotics, of course, in my mind, means I've got a robot who's got a brain. That was also your intro, where basically we are looking at um, artificial intelligence and then the name of your own fund, Singularity. Uh, and I don't know how many people are actually familiar with what Singularity actually means. Do you want to define it? And then perhaps we start circling back also to what can nature teach us in our constant move towards singularity and mm -hmm. that machines are taking more and more over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we redefined it a little bit for us, but I'll, I'll tell you the, the definition of a singularity was original by physics and, and maths. And it is the moment in time and the point in time and the location in time uh, that is where everything happens and is and at the same time nothing so the black hole can be seen as a uh, as the singularity because everything and nothing is there um, and technology the tech community took that over a little bit and connected it to the progression of artificial intelligence uh, and that's what it's widely known as now so the moment where artificial intelligence exceeds human intelligence um, and we're seeing this, I mean, they attach to this Moore's law um, that basically you have um, computing power that actually spurs uh, higher artificial intelligence is getting uh, cheaper every year and better every year. And, and it's, it's actually now more exponential or tenfold than it doubles. And so people have this point in time that they think will be this moment of singularity where machines exceed human intelligence. And the link to the, the, phys the physics or mathematical term is also there, everything is a nothing because you don't know where we go from there. Because you used to assume, we assume, humans assume that humans are the most intelligent species on earth. And that because of that, we define the future of earth. So if there's another intelligence, uh, an AI, in this point of singularity, they will determine it. And that's why it's, a lot, it's rather scary in that, um, in that definition. We don't see it as scary because we, we basically redefined it as the fact that there are a number of technologies, not only AI, that are progressing exponentially, that are you know, changing the world as we speak. And the one thing we do notice is more and more of them are happening at the same time and they're using each other to, to propel each other. And, and so we, I think if I thought that there was a moment uh, where AI would take over humans that is nearby, I wouldn't have thought about an investment vehicle. I would have thought a few other strategies yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, to, yeah. to survive or whatever. Yeah. Um, so personally, actually, uh, I don't think we're that close to it. But I do think that we're close to, we are already in a time and more and more, uh, you know, we will feel that technologies are changing our lives much, much faster than ever. Yes, no, I think this is so interesting what you were saying, especially about machines all of a sudden even feeding off each other. Because my, my um, question always was, okay, whenever can a machine be smarter than the input it needs, okay, in order to create that smartness? 
Okay, and then with you, what you were just saying en passant, saying, look, if a machine communicates with another machine through the Internet of Things and sees, okay, trial and error, and that actually is the evolution within that intelligence, mm -hmm. I, as a machine, can look at that and, again, apply to whatever, as, as input, apply to whatever I am kind of trying to get better and better and better at, and then ultimately uh, really come to singularity that I don't need the human brain. And there I'm circling back to nature because the capacity of our brain cells is huge. How we apply or how much we apply and actually integrate in our decision-making process as humans, okay, and I'm not an expert here, it's just, you know, as you read as a layman and try to make sense, is really minute and apart from that 90 percent of our decision making is not necessarily rational which when it comes to machine machine learning and mach machine de decisions is totally based on just data data analytics uh and and spitting out whatever result there comes so so i wonder whether you know whatever the result is from a machine is already not qualitatively speaking much higher than what a human human not human brain human in the mix of conscious and subconscious decisions could come up with in terms of for example managing a crisis yeah there's a there's a really good book on this called human compatible i forgot the guy who wrote it actually but it's uh i'll think about it i'll send it to you um but it's an amazing book because he described also this uh the problem of this fear we have from ai taking over because when what what if we have something that's much faster and smarter than anything we do um but there is this problem and he solved it and he, he suggested a solution that you could give the ai also the emotional goals of the human but you'd have to feed it in data and that way you could see, you could feed it basically my behavior and what I would do and what I, if I would, I'd be sad if a certain outcome came, you know. So, so there is, there are suggestion, suggestions of how to, to mitigate uh, machines just rationally plowing then through. Then we grow up, then we grow up. We have to feed that as well to the machine because yeah. we would be sad if we don't get a piece of chocolate when we are five. And then when we are 50, we're like, Oh, I'm so happy I didn't get a piece of chocolate. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, the one thing that AI certainly already now does better than us is process large amounts of data. And I mean, we, what we do extremely well, the human brain can do extremely well, is just take in different uh, types of data and different types of outcomes and process it through and come up with an idea. But also we're not good at then implementing all of it. Yeah. And an AI can process all this data, come up with th thousands of solutions and also with the help of talking to other machines just implement all of it at once or you know at several places get way more feedback from trial and error um, but i think uh, again it's about applicability yeah? and the reasons why you can't apply things are are many fold so sometimes a technology doesn't make it because when it's actually doable but humans don't like it and we just put it away yeah. um, or when the regulatory environment doesn't really like it so it's not always a technology that is applicable that doesn't uh, that succeeds it's it's so many factors huh? yeah uh, yeah and and let me pick up on another word you said earlier evelyn and that was fear you know the fear of ai and let's try to apply it again to crisis management crisis handling and if i look at the markets you know there is always this okay how do you make money on financial markets in general and especially if the vix index or the volatility of the markets are going up meaning that there's a lot of fear a lot of insecurity buying selling good day after a bad day so i wonder you know the the, the basic credo when we had it in our pre-discussion is always okay buy low and sell high and this is how you make money on the stock exchange mm -hmm. but it's not as easy is it especially if you look at behavioral finance and how much is actually driven in this herd behavior of buying selling or just being erratic for a while or the type of crisis mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, from what I learned, but just empirically or from what I've experienced investors do or what I've watched, the selling is the more difficult part. It seems, it's also for me, um, it seems much easier to come to a conclusion to buy something. But you said that the, in, a successful investor buys low, sells high. And I think the selling high is the difficulty because the moment things went high, you somehow you you always kind of feel like, it will go even further and very often you don't dare to sell when something is falling down at the time where you should sell yeah 
And I mean, the one thing that I would uh, stop doing is, is, is investing in any kind of company that cannot prove, but that, that, that speaks to our approach, of course, I'm biased here, <laughs> that kind of prove that they're able to bring something to market and that they're able to survive. Yeah? So, I mean, we did see quite a lot of renewed investments in actually also smaller tech companies that, weren't, that were prom, in promising technologies but had no kind of cash generation and not even the liquidity to, to prove that they, were, that they were able to survive this phase. Um, so I think, uh, you know, you need to think about removing certain mindsets um, and certain setups. And this is the reason why that this is uh, passionate to me is I think governments fail to do this, yeah? Because by just, by um, bringing savior type money to the system ahead of the crisis even happening. Yeah? So you knew that something was going to happen because you were, you were shutting down the economy, so to say. Yeah? You, were shutting, you were telling people to shut down uh, whatever they were doing to protect the world from this virus. And uh, as a result of something that you decided as a government, uh, you thought you'd put in some money to save people and companies from what would happen. Yeah. So first of all, you didn't let the system react to nature. So you don't even know what's going to happen. You just assumed that something's, you know, this is going to happen if we don't do this manipulation. So it's like preemptive intervention before understanding how humanity, economies, systems or anything would have worked. And then you went ahead and provided some sort of solution to the problem you created by providing money to all sorts of companies. But also there, you didn't wait for companies to find a solution themselves. You didn't wait for them to, 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 to find a way out of this or for some of them to just show up as foul eggs and remove them. And, uh, and this is, a, I think, yeah, it's been taken away from us. It's been taken away from, from us as a strategy as well because with equity markets then rebounding very quickly with the event of you know, this government support coming from or whatever uh, political support if you want to say, um, you basically removed uh, the opportunity or you took away the opportunity for things to remove themselves. Yeah, to detox. And, so, yeah. and you know, you are like the very first person that, that mentions exactly that. And I, and I like that because it is very non-PC. And of course, the government stepping in is a great, is, is a great idea because businesses will survive. However, Without that, any kind of crisis, would they really be able to survive and thus have the right to stay on? Yeah. Or what we're seeing right now is just a further inflation of some sort of bubble uh, of companies that at the end of the day, once you remove the subsidies or the help, will go bust anyway with a lot of shareholders or participants going down the drain with them. So this natural detox that could have happened it uh, was interrupted by the government stepping in, people getting euphoria, and then, you know, investing into something that might not be valid in the long run. This is what you're mm -hmm. saying. Yes. And I mean, I mean, what we, you could say that our portfolio in the sense selects, you know, it's also a positive way to formulate it or, you know, by not excluding something, but we are excluding something actually. By creating our index and, and our fund eventually, uh, we're excluding anything that isn't demonstrating the ability to apply innovation. And I mean, this situation, I thought, you know, if we let it uh, pan out for maybe a month longer, yeah, I don't know, would have forced companies to react in a certain way. And then you would have seen um, if they have something around in their business model that can take, you know, grow excessively because it's innovative. And if they were able to remove the thing that didn't work, and then you would have had, you know, again, this, this proof of who can do it and who can't. But currently, if you're just supporting the status quo as much as you can, it, we will find out. It will just take us much, much longer. So, I mean, I'm a little annoyed because I felt like this was a way also for us and investors to, to figure out things. Because now, I mean, we're just assuming, yeah? We're assuming Zoom, uh, video conferencing will take off. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. We had the opportunity to actually maybe see it. 
you know yeah fast. yeah yeah, yeah. and take that nature take its course and this is where we are closing the circle evelyn because at the end of the day what nature shows us it's not the smartest the richest uh, and the strongest that survives but those companies human beings that adapt to change and this adaptation to change yeah. you know even in epigenetics at the end of the day results in a fitter better environment to confront whatever the next crisis may bring in a better way. And that somehow was very unnatural, you know, stepping in the government, saving Lufthansa or whatever airline is very unnatural and, and thus really taking the natural uh, impulse of either you're strong enough or sorry. You know? And you know, they might have even survived. You, base, you don't even know if some companies could have come up with some other investors that stepped in um, or if they had something in their business model that could have, could have helped save them. You don't even know because you didn't even wait uh, for them to scramble and, and you know, go through that process to help themselves. So I love it. I love it. Evelyn, thank you so much. I think we have had here quite a little, quite a little bit of real insight of a different approach on how do you actually really look at the reality, which is nature, and apply what nature does and evolution did and continues to do to crisis management being as us humans or as businesses and funds as well. So thank you so much for uh, you know, sharing your insight and thus mentoring it to our community, Evelyn. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And thank you, everybody. I hope that was super insightful for you, too. And I wonder if you have great ideas or you just want to hear about something, um, let me know. You know where to find me on Mentorate TV. I'll be there for you. Yeah.